Come and sit down, come and sit down. Amen, amen. Welcome out to the Father's house of Lacey, amen. Let's go ahead and enter God's presence with worship, amen. As we sing the song, I will enter his gates with thanksgiving. I will enter in his gates with thanksgiving in my heart.
salvation for him uh, and God God willing he would receive Christ before uh, he, he meets Jesus amen um, so with that being said let's go ahead and lift these knees up and uh, ask you open us up in prayer Father, we come before Father you, God. God we, we thank you, Lord. I ask God, God that you would move. We pray God, that you would help these God, hands, move, God. Move, God. Father God, 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 before God, your throne, God, that you would pray right God, now, Lord God, the back that you would move by your God, grace and your mercy, God. God. We pray for God, we thank you, Lord God. What you're doing, God. Go serving at home and abroad, God. Bridge me, God, your hand upon her mind and body, God. She goes to read her spot, God. We pray in every city of Jerusalem, God. Your holy city, God. Your people there, we pray for the peace of the city, Lord. God. We pray for to revive you, God, God, in this God, city, God, God across the face of the earth, God. God your spirit poured out, Lord God. God. Oh, God, who be healing, God, we pray, God, God, for Abigail's mercy, God, God. For Patricia Simpson, Lord God, for Richard's uncle, Lord God. Father God, we pray, God, my God, Lord God, God, help us in this place, Lord God. Oh, Rabban, do us forget it, Amen, God, we pray, God, we pray, God, we pray, God, we God, help us. Bravos and Lakes, God. Thank you, Lord. Father, the Gonzales is in you all. More than our coming out from each other, we pray, God, for our truth. Oh, God, we thank you, Lord, for what you're doing in this place. Father, God, we come boldly before your throne of grace, God. 
Father, to enter into the very throne room of heaven, God, asking you, God, to move, God, by your power, God, by your might, God, your wisdom, Lord God, your divine purpose, Lord God. Father, have your way in this place, Lord God, that your will be done, God, here on earth, God, as it is in heaven, God. Move in these needs, God, as we bring them before you, God, our unsafe friends, our family, Lord God. Father, those in need healing, God, our fellow churches and believers, God. Father, we pray, God, for revival, God. We pray the blood of Jesus, Lord God. Cover and touch lives, Lord God. We pray your word go forth in power and dominion, God. Pour out your Holy Spirit upon us this day, God. Father, God, we pray, God, meet with us, Lord God. Father, we need your presence, Lord God. We need you to meet with us, Lord God. Father, help us that we have desperate hearts, God. Father, that desire you, God, above all else, Lord God. We pray, help us this day, Lord God. Touch us in the mighty name of Jesus Christ and God's people sin. Amen. Hallelujah. Say good morning to one another. Good morning. good to us, isn't he? Man, I am astounded when I think about how good God is to us. Amen. The world ain't so great. You know? It's not always a nice place. Amen. Not, it's not always good things happening, but God, right? God is good to us. Amen. He is good to us. Amen. Hallelujah. Uh, no church Wednesday night. We're getting, uh, I believe we're going to have about three Bible studies left, and then we're going to go back to Wednesday evening service, so just change course, doing a little bit different things, trying to get fellowship, amen, had a lot of fellowship yesterday, how many know fellowship is good, amen, amen. amen. it is good for the soul, it's good to be around the people of God, amen, it's good to uh, uh, spend that time, amen, and the Bible studies have definitely been a blessing in that regard, um, but we will be shifting gears um, in about the, probably after, uh, after the Pioneer Rally. So we'll, after that, we'll switch gears back. Um, so Bible study Tuesday night, it will be, as far as I know here, unless somebody tells me otherwise, and then we'll do it wherever, or my house. I don't know, I have to, I might have to um, fight with my wife about that. <laughs> A loving fight, full of loving discussion. Amen. Saturday morning prayer, 7 a.m. No, nothing happening this Saturday uh, aside from prayer. Um, but next, uh, the following two weeks, we'll be outreaching for the suicide outreach. And then so uh, September 3rd, I'll have flyers by then. We're going to go out and start um, letting people know about the suicide prevention outreach. That first week of September is suicide prevention week. So September is suicide prevention month. So um, it'll give us an opportunity. You can ask businesses, hey, can I leave this flyer here? People are very receptive about that. I, I, one thing that I like about this outreach is you don't get a, little, a lot of pushback. Most people have universally, we say, yeah, this isn't a good thing. Let's do what we can to stop it. So um, we're going to believe God that the gospel will go forth in power and dominion and people will be touched. Amen. So um, 
Let's Believe God. I have to. And then also the um, Pioneer Rally is coming up. That will be, there are flyers in the back. I should have grabbed one so I knew what I was talking about. But that will be the uh, second week of September, or yeah, the second full week, the 15th, 16th, and 17th. 15th, 16th, and 17th in McMinnville. If you want to go, um, let me know. The church will help with hotel rooms. We can get those covered and paid for. We can make uh, reservations. So if anybody wants to go, um, if you need to work out transportation, let me know. We can figure that part out too. But I would encourage anybody that is able to go, to go. Um, so it'll be Thursday evening, 7.30, Friday evening at 7.30, and then Saturday, 8.30, uh, three seminars on Saturday, 8.30, 9.15, and 10 a.m. So um, Joe Campbell, Richard Ruby, Dave Marks, and Kevin Foley. So heavy hitters, amen. So it'll be good good ministry. Um, so if you can be a part of that, I encourage you very strongly um, to do that. Hallelujah. We want to take offering this morning. Amen. Amen. There was once a rich man who was near death and uh, he was very grieved because he'd worked so hard his whole life and he'd accumulated all this wealth. And he knew he was a good man, but he knew he wasn't going to be able to take it with him to heaven. So he began to pray. You know, he's like, I want to take some of this with me. So he began to pray, God, just let me let me take something, just just a memento of, of all the work that I did, something from this earth that, that represents how, how hard I did. And the man implores the angels to speak to God. He's, he's, he's dead. He says, okay, let me see what, let me see what we can do. And he talks with God. He says, okay, okay, we've got an arrangement. You can bring one briefcase with you. He gets to bring one briefcase. So the man, he, he goes, the, he's overjoyed. He's going to get to take this briefcase into heaven. He gets his briefcase. He gets gold bars and he carefully arranges them in the briefcase so he can fit as many gold bars as he can. And then he's He's waltzing into heaven's gate and St. Peter stops him and it's like kind of like the TSA, you know, for heaven. And he goes, hey, what's in the bag? You know, we got to <laughs> inspect your bag before we let you in heaven, you know. And uh, so he opens it and, and Peter looks at the gold in his briefcase and says, you brought pavement? Nobody got it. <laughs> you brought pavement? The streets are paved with gold. It would be like if we put some asphalt, you know, we're all happy that we're bringing our asphalt with us. You know, we got some, or some cold patch, you know, ah, we, we, we got it, the symbol of our success. Amen, and it counts as nothing. In heaven. Matthew 16, 26, what would it profit a man if he would gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for your soul? I have not seen nor ear heard than what God has prepared for those who love him. Nor has it entered into the hearts of man. Meaning we can't even, we, we, can't, we haven't even thought of anything so good and so glorious. Amen. And everything that we've accumulated, everything we think is valuable now, will pale in the glory of that. Amen. Giving helps us, amen, live with the detachment to earthly things. Amen, we need to live with the detachment. We don't want to be that guy trying to hold on to our bag of pavement. Amen, God has something better for us. Amen, let's give tithes, offerings besides. Amen, let's be blessed and ask God to help us. Amen. Yeah. In Jesus' name. Father God, we thank you right now, Lord God, for your gospel message. God, we thank you for your presence here, God. Father God, for your power, your goodness, your love, Lord God, I pray, help us to give, Lord God, and to, and to honor you, God, in all that we have and do. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. amen. Hallelujah. I will enter in his gates. I will enter in his gates with thanksgiving in my heart. I will enter in his courts with praise. I will say this is the day.
for he has made me glad. Hallelujah. Amen. Thank you, Anna. Amen. I was uh, uh, pleased this morning. Amen. I'm really, I'm going to preach on essential worship this morning. But amen. How many know um, worship? Worship is very important. Okay? I want to gloss over this. And we, we are in a, an age where there are some churches where they've decided worship is so important because of the emotional stimuli, if you will, they've got all done, they dispense with preaching. So they have hour and a half long worship services. That's not where we're going either. Amen. Worship has a point. Amen. It has an intention. Second Samuel 6, 5 to 23. For that, though, I want to relay a story. I mean, this is something everyone here, I'm sure, has heard about. It knows about the ship, the Titanic. In the early morning hours of the 15th of April, 1912, in the North Atlantic Ocean, four days into her maiden voyage from Southampton to New York City, the largest ocean liner in service at the time, with 2,224 people on board, struck an iceberg at 11.40 p.m. on Sunday the 14th of April, 1912. She sank in two hours and 40 minutes. This resulted in the death of more than 1,500 people, making it one of the deadliest peacetime maritime disasters in history. Over 1,500 people went into eternity from that ship. Some very tragic things about that ship. The uh, the third class, you had your first class passengers closest to the decks, your second class, and then down below, the bowels of the ship, you will, was the third class, the immigrants, the uh, poor. And there are stories of even people being locked in and closing those bulkheads and locking those people in their in their staterooms so they wouldn't flood the the lifeboats. Tragedy in multiple levels. The unsinkable ship, a symbol of wealth, prosperity. And as the ship slipped under the icy waters, there was a quintet led by Wallace Hartley playing on the violin. He said he played the song, Nearer My God to Thee. His passengers spoke of Nearer My God to Thee being sung by the survivors as they drifted on the water. But it's not clear whether they were singing along to the band or whether what the band played just stayed with them. I'm going to read you the words to this hymn. It's old. Most of us probably do not know it. Nearer, my God, to thee. Nearer to thee. Even though it be a cross that raiseth me, still all my song shall be nearer, my God, to thee. Nearer, my God, to thee. Nearer to thee. Though like the wanderer the sun gone down, Darkness be over me, my rest is stone. Yet in my dreams I'd be nearer, my God, to thee. Nearer, my God, to thee, nearer to thee. Let the way appear, steps unto heaven, all thou sendest me in mercy given. Angels to beckon me, nearer, my God, to thee. Nearer, my God, to thee, nearer to thee. Let the way appear. Then with my walking thoughts, bright with thy praise, my waking thoughts, bright with thy praise, out of my stony greets, Bethel shall I raise. So by my woes to be, nearer my God to thee, nearer my God to thee. Or if on joyful wings, cleaving the sky, sun, moon, and stars forgot, upward I fly, still all my song shall be, nearer my God to thee, nearer my God to thee. Man, I want to preach this morning on essential worship. Amen. You know that worship is essential regardless of what is happening to us. Worship is essential regardless of what is happening around us. Man, think about these men um, playing on this boat two and a half hours before it sank into the sea. Playing as it, as it said that they, um, it says that they played until the incline was such that they could no longer stay seated. They were no longer able to play. They played this song. It's a song of worship, a song about being in the very presence of God. There's people facing death, and yet they find time for worship. Amen. 
Worship is meant to establish the presence and the dominion of God and give His Spirit a conduit to move. This is why we worship. Worshiping God is about drawing nearer to Him. We're drawing nearer to God. It is about the space that separates this life from the next growing thin. Pastor uh, Warner, um, in his uh, sermon at the uh, July conference, he talked about there's a, there's a song... Um, I believe it's another in the fire, and there's a verse in there that says, I see the, the um, space, as a space between us wears thin. I hear the roar of the heavens as a space wears thin. It's this idea that, that we are actually touching heaven, touching God's presence, where, we, you know, sometimes that space that separates this life and eternal life, the real life, can seem pretty, pretty thick, Amen. We can have a lot of cares of this world and things that distract us and encumber us and make it very hard, feel very separated from the real life, the spirit line. But sometimes, amen, in worship and in God's presence, that space can feel so thin. That's what worship is meant to establish, where we can feel him in the presence of God. That's what it's about. Amen. Let's read out of 2 Samuel 6, 5 to 23. And it's a lengthy verse of scripture. I do want to set it up real quick. The Philistines had invaded the, the, the people of uh, Israel. They had taken the ark back with them. Okay, They took the ark of the covenant back with them. This contained some of the manna that they were fed, symbolizing the provision of God. The broken tablets that God himself had inscribed the, the, the Ten Commandments on. This was God's presence, a symbol of his presence. They had taken it back. And God was, was doing bad things, cursing them. They realized it was associated with the, the ark. And so the, um, this is after David and, and the people of uh, Israel have secured a victory, and they're bringing the ark back with them to their own land. Verse 5. And David and all those of the house of Israel were celebrating before the Lord with songs and lyres and harps and tambourines and castanets and cymbals when they came to the threshing floor of Nacon. Uzzah put out his hand to the ark of God and took hold of it, for the oxen stumbled. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Uzzah, and God struck him down there because of his error. And he died there beside the ark of God. And David was angry because the Lord had broken out against Uzzah. And that place is called Perez Uzzah to this day. And David was afraid of the Lord that day. And he said, how can the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord come to me? So David was not willing to take the Ark of the Lord into the city of David. But David took it aside to the house of Obed-Edom the Gittite. And the ark of the Lord remained in the house of Obed-Edom the Gittite three months. And the Lord blessed Obed-Edom and all of his household. And it was told King David, The Lord has blessed the household of Obed-Edom and all that belongs to him because of the ark of God. So David went and brought up the ark of, the God, of God from the house of Obed-Edom to the city of David with rejoicing. And when those who bore the ark of the Lord had gone six steps, he sacrificed an ox and a fatted animal. So David danced before the Lord with all his might. And David was wearing a linen ephod. So David and all the house of Israel brought up the ark of the Lord with shouting. And with the sound of the horn and the ark of the Lord came into the city of David. Michael, the daughter of Saul, looked out the window and saw King David leaping and dancing before the Lord, and she despised him in her heart. And they brought in the ark of the Lord and set it in its place inside the tent that David had pitched for it. And David offered burnt offerings and peace offerings before the Lord. And when David had finished offering the burnt offerings and the peace offerings, he blessed the people in the name of the Lord of hosts and distributed among the people the whole multitude of Israel, both men and women, a cake of bread, a portion of meat, and a cake of raisins to each one. Then all the people departed, each to his own house. And David returned to bless his household. But Michal, the daughter of Saul, came out to meet David and said, How the king of Israel dishonored him, Israel honored himself today, uncovering himself 
And David said to Michal, oh, I'm sorry, uncovering himself today before the eyes of his servants, female servants, as one of the vulgar fellows shamelessly uncovers himself. And David said to Michal, it was before the Lord who chose me above your father and above all his house to appoint me as prince over Israel, the people of the Lord, and I will celebrate before the Lord. I will make myself yet more contemptible than this, and I will be abased in your eyes. But by the female servants of whom you've spoken, by them I shall be held in honor. And Michal, the daughter of Saul, had no children to the day of her death. Man, let's pray. Father God, I pray, God, that you would help us, God. Father, help us, God, to have a heart of worship, God. As we come into your presence, God, as we come into your house, Lord God. Father God, that we would worship you, God, that we would hold you, God, as holy, God. Father God, help us, God. I pray, Lord God, establish your presence in our midst, Lord God, I pray, God, help us in Jesus' mighty name. Hallelujah. Amen. I want to look first, amen, at essential attitude. There are some, uh, we can have, friend, an attitude of worship. Or we can have an attitude of disdain. We can have an attitude, amen, that we, we just don't care. You know, worship is for good times and bad. Amen? You know that you can be going through a very terrible time and still worship God? In fact, you should. In our text, it takes place right after a major victory of God's people. You know, they, they defeated the Philistines. You can imagine they're happy. They got the ark. They're like, yeah, let's do this. Right? They're excited. It's easy to worship. You know, it's easy to worship when things are going well. Amen? When you just got the promotion or you just got, you know, something good happened today. You, 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 you found the thing that you lost last week. You know, whatever it is. <laughs> happens to me anyway. I found all three of my Leathermans. I kept buying them to replace them, and all of a sudden they were all there. It's easy to worship when that happens. God heals you, easy to worship. But then something happens. The, the oxen stumble, and Uzzah goes and he touches the ark, and he's killed. Now something bad has happened. Amen? David doesn't understand. See, because when things are going good, worship's almost automatic, right? We say it all the time, oh, thank God. Thank God. Right? Something good happens. It's automatic. But it is it touches the ark and God judges him. The ark is described as being on a cart being pulled by oxen. That's not the way that God commanded them to transport the ark. This is important to recognize. There were supposed to be poles of wood that went through the rings attached to the ark that the priests would carry. Was it supposed to be pulled by an a, a ox on a cart? And further, Uzzah, the ark had been at his father's house for 20 years. Abinadab was his father. The ark had been at his house for 20 years. You know, he probably kind of, the ark's there in the house. It probably got a little commonplace, right? It's like a, a granny's trunk, you know? Oh, yeah, that used to belong to my grandma. Maybe sitting on it sometimes. Maybe just viewing it as calm. And this is a trap we can fall into. Is we can begin to view the presence of God as something common. As something commonplace. And this was the issue with Uzzah is that he was just fine. He took it for granted that God was in that place. But now David doesn't agree with what God did says that David was angry at God, right? And now he doesn't want to worship. He says, we'll take the ark over to, to Obed-Edom's house. We're not taking it back. I'm angry at God. I'm not going to worship. He doesn't think God is fair. You know that worship becomes a little bit more difficult when God's not doing what we want him to do? Amen? Worship becomes a little more difficult when we don't understand everything. We say, oh God, you're not fair. Or maybe we're like David and we're mad at God. And so because of that, we're not going to worship. But amen, it's important to know that worship is about God. It's about who He is. 
Exodus 33, 15 to 19. This is after God has given Moses the instructions on how to build the ark. This is after God has explained how he is to be worshipped, how the, the uh, tabernacle is to be set up. He's given him all these instructions and listen to this. Moses tells, says to God in Exodus 33, 15 to 19, If your presence will not go with me, do not bring us up from here. For how shall it be known that I have found favor in your sight, and I and your people? Is it not in your going with us, so that we are distinct? I and your people from every other people on the face of the earth. And the Lord said to Moses, This very thing that you have spoken I will do. For you have found favor in my sight, and I know you by name. Moses said, Please show me your glory. And he said, I will make my goodness pass before you and will proclaim before you my name, the Lord. And I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious. And I will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. Moses said, let your presence go with us or else don't even let us move. Don't, don't, we won't even go up from here. If you're not with us, if your presence is not here, don't bring us up from here. There's no point. Mm -hmm. You see, Moses understood how essential the presence of God is for his people. This is, he said, this is what makes us a distinct people. Amen. Without God's presence, friend, what do we have? What is a church service without God's presence? Man, this is why, uh, um, you know, when, when I see or experience empty, dead religion, it perplexes me. Why get together? Why do any of it without God's presence? Amen. Amen? If God's not meeting with us, we're missing the defining factor. This is, he said, this is how people will know. This is what makes us distinct. Can I tell you the same is true for us today? God's presence is what makes his people distinct. Amen. Is his presence. Worship is about establishing his presence. Amen. And God says he will be gracious to whom? He will be gracious and he'll show mercy to whom he'll show mercy. See, David doesn't, doesn't understand this. He thinks God's unfair. He sees what happens to Uzzah and he, he, he's thrown for a loop. And so then the ark goes into Obed-Edom's house. And David sees the blessing of God. The blessing of God's presence in Obed-Edom's house. It says that all that he has, his whole household was blessed. And David understands something about God's grace and his mercy. I will be gracious on whom I'll be gracious to. I'll show mercy to whom I'll show mercy to. Amen. Can I tell you, worship is about who God is. It's about the nature of God, the power of his presence. This is what worship is. It's not about how you're feeling. I'm sorry to inform you. It's not about what we think. It's about who God is. It's not about whether we deserve his presence. Man, but it requires an attitude like Moses, where we view the presence of God as essential. Is that how you view, amen, when you pray, when you come into a worship service, how do you view the presence of God? I'm praying, God, God if you want to show up, show up. If not, I'm cool. Don't worry. I'll be good. I'm good either way. You know, like when you're trying to pick out a restaurant, you know, and you're like, you say, hey, babe, where do you want to go? I don't care where you want to go. It doesn't matter to me. So I got God, yeah, if you show up, it doesn't matter, whatever. You do your thing, God. <laughs> or are we like Moses and say, no, God, if you don't show, I'm not leaving here. I'm on my knees in prayer. I'm not leaving here until you show up, until you meet with me, until your presence is here, until your presence is felt. I'm staying right here. 
Do you ever pray with that attitude, friend? Talking about essential attitudes of worship. David understood how essential worship was. Amen. I want to look at the first mention of the word worship. In Genesis 22, the Hebrew word, the Hebrew word shakab is first trans translated as worship part of the root of a Shekinah glory. The word Shekinah is translated as worship. And this is a story God has commissioned Abraham to travel three days to Mount Moriah and to sacrifice his son Isaac. It's where we, get, we see the first word. And, and Abraham tells his uh, companions, he says, stay here with the donkey. The boy and I will go there to worship and then we'll come back to you. It's the first mention of the word worship as it's translated, but Genesis 22 is not the first occurrence of that Hebrew word. The first mention is found in Genesis 18, where the same Hebrew word is translated, bowed to the ground. The Lord appeared to Abraham. He ran from the entrance to the tent and bowed to the ground and said, My Lord, if I have found favor with you, please do not go on past your soul. This is where we first find that word that is translated worship. Is Abraham says, God, if I found favor with you, do not just go past me. Do not move on right past me. This is that same attitude of understanding how essential, amen, the presence of God is. Worship is tied, amen, to our recognition of the need for the presence of God. Do you pray that way? God, don't just pass me by. I need you to stop. I need you to be here a while with me. I need your presence. Amen. But the other attitudes we also have to contend with are the attitudes of other people. Amen? Amen. We'll have to contend with the attitudes of other people. Michal was a princess. This is the daughter of Saul. She grew up, amen, in the, the king's house. She was probably used to the goodly life, amen. She probably had a few nice things. She probably dressed very nice. And here we see her embarrassed by her husband's worship. Here we see her, she's watching him. He's dancing in an in a ephod, which is like the linen undergarments. He's essentially dancing in his underwear. And don't worry, we're not going to dance in our underwear. But she's embarrassed by his worship. Here's David. He's not trying to impress her. He's not trying to impress anybody. He's just trying to worship God. His heart is to worship God. David understood how essential worship was. And I tell you, those who understand, amen, who love God, if you love God, you'll be worshipful. You want to worship him because you recognize him, and it's, it, it's, it's all we can do. In response to all that he's done and all that he is, all we can do is worship him. Sansong shouts to the Lord. Amen. Song of worship. I look for the words because now I'll oh, never cease to worship you. you know, and never see that we will be worshipful. When we understand who God is, we'll be worshipful. Amen. Worship isn't about looking cool. Amen. Mm -hmm. Some say there's some churches that miss this. Everything's about looking cool, you know, making sure everything's just right. It's not about looking cool. It's not about impressing anybody. You know, it isn't even about impressing God. God never is like, oh man, I think these guys are these guys are impressive. <laughs> it's simply because he's worthy. It's about our hearts. It's about our attitude. Mm -hmm. Because he's worthy, and we know that we need his presence. We rely on it more than it. We need it like air. Yeah. We need his presence, friend. Next, I want to look at essential ingredients. 
Along with the proper attitude and desire for God's presence, there's some essential ingredients to worship. Amen. First one is preparation. Amen. We need to prepare ourselves for worship. It says that the ark, after it was brought into the city, it was brought into the tent that David had pitched for it. That David had prepared a place for the presence of God. Friend, this is why prayer before service is important. This is why preparation before service is important. Preparing our hearts and doing things and being ready to worship God. Because preparation is essential. We need to prepare ourselves, our attitudes. Amen? Let's, let's check ourselves. Are you bringing anger towards God? Are you bringing some other, maybe embarrassment over worshiping God? I don't want to look like I'm too into worship. I don't want to look too into God. Then what are you too into? Amen? What is it that you're into? You're not into God, okay. But what are you into? I'll never forget. I'm not going to pretend like I'm this holy roller and God's always just, uh, you know, I just meet with God every, uh, every other day in my closet. God spoke to me a number of times. And one time, I'll never forget, I wasn't even saved. Being at a concert as a sinner, drinking, doing drugs at this heavy metal concert. And I remember God just stopping the room. Just just like, like it's like almost everybody else was there, but it, like, like they couldn't see me. Like it was just, and he asked me, he goes, what are these people doing? What are these people doing? And I looked and they're thronging the stage, right? The band's up there. These people are gyrating and doing everything else in the world. And I, and I answered, I said, they're worshiping. They're worshiping. And I tell you, you're going to worship something. You're either going to worship something like these washed up drug addicts on a stage that don't deserve it. Or you're going to worship God who deserves all that you have. You will worship something with your life. We end up worshiping one way or another. So if we don't come ready to worship God, what are we worshiping? We need to prepare our attitudes, our heart, distractions. You know, there's always going to be something trying to distract you from the things of God. From now until we make heaven our home and the Lord is our light, there are always going to be other things, bright, shiny objects trying to steal our attention. Man, the other essential ingredient is consecration. The word consecrate means to make or declare something as sacred. So then what is sacred? Dedicated to the purpose of worship of God. We need to make ourselves dedicated, consecrated, set apart, set aside for the purpose and the worship of God. In the tabernacle, there were instruments dedicated to the worship of God. There were times dedicated to the worship of God. There were things that were, that were said that these can only be used for the worship of God. We need to, this is what worship service is about. It is a time that is consecrated, set apart to the worship of God. This is what it's about. The tabernacle was called the tent of meeting. Meeting God. That's what we're trying to do is to meet with God. Are you consecrated to the purpose and worship of God? 1 Corinthians 6, 19-20 Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. Amen. We must be consecrated for the worship of God. What does this mean? It means that our purpose isn't to go do every little sin and every little thing that we want to do. There's some exclusivity in our lives. Amen. 
We must be consecrated, dedicated not to sin, but to the worship and purpose of God. This is what Uzzah's uh, issue was. His failure was that he did not, he was not consecrated to God. He was trying to do it his way. This was the opposite. You know, this is the opposite of consecration. When we want to do it our way, Forget what God says. I'm going to do it my way. That's the opposite of consecration. And that was his sin. Joshua 3, 2-5. At the end of three days, the officers went through the camp and commanded the people, as soon as you see the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord being carried by the Levitical priests, then you shall set out from your place and follow it. Yet there shall be a distance between you and it, about 2,000 cubits in length. Do not come near it, in order that you may know the way you shall go. For you have not passed by this way before. And Joshua said to the people, Consecrate yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. Man, can I tell you, worship service, the time before our service, it's not a time filler. It's not, um, uh, it's not, we just do this, you know, because we go, you know, we're trying to make our service, make sure it's at least an hour, so uh, pastor preaches a little short usually, so we just you know, pad that time. It's not so we give time so everybody that's late, we can still be worshiping, so that, that that's not what it's for. Amen. It's not a concert. Nobody would pay to hear me. <laughs> Nobody would pay to hear me anyway. It's not a concert. Amen? It's not like we go, this is a problem with some of the uh, mega churches. You know, you go to just watch these people on stage. You're not worshiping. They're doing it for you. Yeah, pretty good worship. Oh, yeah, I like that. I like that. Oh, that's good worship right there. You see that worship? No, it's for all of us. We are all engaged in worship. We lift our hands. We close our eyes. We sing. We clap. Why? Because worship. We're not like Saul's daughter, Michael, just watching from the window. That's a little embarrassing. Why? Because she wasn't there worshiping with him. She, was, she should have been right next to her husband worshiping with him. Hey Amen. Can I tell you, critics are a dime a dozen. God wants people to worship. He wants to be worshipped. Not because he has an ego problem. Because he, it's the only proper response when you know who he is. And when you understand how important his presence is. Amen. Worship requires active participation. The worship service is consecrated time where we approach God and invite his power and his presence to do great things among us. This is what we want. Think about the end of this scripture in Joshua. He says, Joshua said to people, consecrate yourself for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. This is what we want. Amen? We want God to do wonders among us. This leads me to essential outcomes. Lastly, essential outcomes. The Ark of the Covenant was where God would meet with Moses. It said that God would speak to Moses. The Ark, it, the, the, it was this golden chest. There were two cherubim on top of it. It said that God would speak to Moses. Between the cherubim. This is where God met with Moses. It contained the tablets that God himself had personally inscribed. The ark represented the presence of God. It was the presence of God. It led the people. Think about this. The ark went through and the Jordan parted and they were able to pass through. The ark made the presence of God made a way for the people. It brought them blessing. It brought them victory in battle. Amen. This is what we have an expectation of the presence of God, friend. It will bless your life. It will bring you victory. It will bring you provision. It will do things in your life. The most essential outcome of worship is establishing the ministering presence of God. I said this before, God is everywhere, but he's not doing the same thing everywhere. We want God to do something here, something different. We want God to draw souls to salvation. 
We want God to convict us of our sins and the things that are wrong in our hearts so that we change. We want God to bring supernatural deliverance from attitudes and mindsets. We want God to heal broken bodies. We want God, amen, to do miracles in our lives, miracles of finance and provision. We want God to do something different here, friend. This is why we need his presence. We want God to do wonderful things, miraculous things, life-changing things. And nextly, the presence of God brings fruitfulness. This is why David decides to bring the ark into the city, right? He sees what's happening at Obed Edom's house. He's like, I want some of that. I want some of that blessing. I want some of that provision. What God is doing there, I want that. In my life, our scripture, our sections, it says that, that Michal had no children until the day of her death. Her refu- Think about this, her refusal. That, that's not in there by accident. That's not postscript. Her refusal to worship. Her embarrassment at the worship of God. Her disdain for the things of God caused her not to be fruitful. Amen. If we want to be fruitful as a congregation, as a church in this city, amen, we need the presence of God. Amen. We want people to come up and, and, and what is going on there? What, what, what is this? It's the presence of God. You don't just get that anywhere. It's not commonplace. In the temple, the Ark of the Covenant was stored in the Holy of Holies. This was the most exclusive place. The temple was arranged. There was, there was a outer courtyard where the Gentiles could come. Then there was an inner courtyard where only Jews could come. And then there was the sanctuary where some Jews could come. And then there was the inner sanctuary where even fewer people could come. And then you got into the Holy of Holies. And only the high priest could enter into the Holy of Holies. And this is where the Ark of the Covenant was. In this isolated place, the, the, the presence of God that just one man of all the people could enter into. And separating the Holy of Holies from the inner sanctuary was this veil. This blue and purple, uh, elaborately woven veil that separated. And behind this veil, the Ark of the Covenant, God's presence. Listen to Matthew 27, 51. And behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And the earth shook and the rocks were split. This is Jesus Christ is crucified. The veil in the temple. That curtain separating us, the common man, from the presence of God is torn from top to bottom. It's completely separated. And we have access now to the very throne room of God, the Holy of Holies. We sing that song, Take Me Into the Holy of Holies. Jesus prepared the way for us to enter into the very presence of God. Man, but just because it is accessible to common people doesn't mean it's commonplace. Say that again, just because it's acceptable to com- accessible to common people does not mean it's commonplace. I, uh, when my in-laws were here, we went to um, the Washington State Capitol building over in Olympia, just to, uh, you know, Olympia's kind of a dump. There's gross things around there, but you go into the Capitol building. It's a, it's a beautiful building. It's the highest uh, masonry dome Honestly, I don't know if it was North America or Western Hemisphere or whatever, but it's it, it, it's an impressive building. There's there's a chandelier, the largest Tiffany's of New York, the largest chandelier they ever made. There's there's all kinds of just it's it's elaborate, it's beautiful. There's Italian marble in there, and anybody can go in there. You can go to the Capitol. Uh, they have it open for tours. You don't they don't ask you for ID. You can just Walt in there and look around. But when you get in that building, you know you're just not any place. 
my kids were in there with me. I was make sure to tell them, hey, don't run, don't scream, don't yell, don't be playing tag. You, you definitely don't want to just throw some garbage out on the ground. You look and you realize you're somewhere that's special. You're somewhere, I mean, it might not be consecrated to the things of God, but it's consecrated to a purpose, right? Mm -hmm. For the passing of laws, for, for, for the state functions of, of this state. How much more the presence of God? How much more the Holy of Holies, the throne room of grace? Hebrews 10, 19 to 22. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with the true heart and full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience, and our bodies washed with pure water. And then we enter into in confidence, right? We can be confident God will be with us. Amen? Amen? Because of Jesus Christ. But we do have to come the proper way. Hallelujah. Let's have every head bowed and every eye closed. Amen. Let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Amen. Maybe this morning you realize what inhibits your worship, friend. What causes you not to be able to worship God in spirit and in truth. Because our scripture tells us, friend, that those who worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. Is the fact, amen, that your conscience is defiled. That there's a purity of heart that is missing. There's attitudes, friends, that are contrary to worship. Maybe there's beliefs about God that, that, that hinder your worship. He's not fair. You're angry at Him. You're resentful. Amen. Can I tell you, there is forgiveness, friend. Consecrate yourself. Don't dedicate your life to pleasure, to revenge, to habits. Consecrate it to God, to His purposes, to the worship of God. Amen. You want to give your life to Jesus Christ this morning. Amen. Just lift up your hand. We'll pray with you. Hallelujah. Let God touch your heart. Sit or backslider in this place. Lift up your hand. We'll, give, we'll pray with you. Amen. Allow God to touch you, to lead you, to guide you. heaven our home. Let's enter into the joy of the Lord, the worship of the Lord, the very presence of God, where we'll see Him face to face, friend. Our worship now, the presence of God now prepares us for when we'll be forever in His presence. Hallelujah. One last call. Send a message. Amen. Amen. I want to challenge us, church. I want to challenge you. I believe we're going to see visitors and we're coming outreaches. I'm working on getting us a revival. I'm, I'm, I'm going spending big. I'm going to find a... I'm going to get us a, a, a good revival real soon. I've asked my pastor who the best guys are that he's been hearing lately. I'm going, to, I'm going to do that. We're going to do that. We're going to have visitors. We're going to see people come. But we all need to be working towards establishing God's presence. Our attitudes, our hearts, our participation, friend, is vital in establishing the presence of God. That's what sets us apart, friend. That's what causes us to be fruitful. Amen. So let's do that. Hallelujah. Amen. This altar's open if you want to come take time to pray, friend. Come with that attitude. God, I need you to meet. I'm not leaving till you meet with me, God. I need your presence. Maybe it's been a while for you since you felt the presence of God. And you need to feel it. You want to feel it. You're hungry for it, friend. Meet with Him. Meet with Him. Hallelujah.
dead empty religion. We don't have to settle for ritual. We don't have to settle for a, a genuflection. I mean, we just go through the motions. No, no, no. We get to get the presence of God. Amen. Amen. It's a great thing about worship. Amen. Hallelujah. Let's go from this place. Amen. Believe in God for good things to come. Believe in for him to help us. Amen. To establish his presence in our midst. Amen. I'm so excited for what God's going to do. Ali, um, uh, JC, if you close in word of prayer. God, thank you for your grace. You are great. Please show us the light and the darkness. Uh, yeah. Amen, amen. Hallelujah. There is uh, food. Actually, I forgot to part of that part. We got some food left over from yesterday. We got a ton of it. So I think we have a ton of it still. So I'm going to uh, also ask God to bless the, the food right now, too. Father God, we thank you, God, for this day. God, I pray, God, that you would touch each heart in this place. God bless this food, this time together, in Jesus' name. Amen, amen, amen. hallelujah.